Today is a special and unique situation. I myself am a social worker. I am also the daughter of my psychotherapist mum, Janine Burelds. Her work has inspired me to work with others and help them achieve their best. I am curious to chat with my mum over a cup of tea and a podcast. I have some questions for her about her work, but also hope to go with the flow. Although I have talked and followed her enthusiastic approach to her work in her role as a palliative care practitioner and as a psychotherapist, I will now, in this slightly more detached way, hopefully gain more understanding and learning from her. My mum tells me that the connection with the therapist is as important as the therapeutic process itself. As Carl Jung states, it's not what you know, it's who you are. Freud shared a psychotherapist should be like an empty canvas so that his clients may project onto him what they need. He also stated that he is mainly interested in the basement of the personality of someone's house. Psychosynthesis is interested in all the floors of the house, including the attic, the sunroof and the balcony from which we can reflect on our connection with the sun and the stars and our higher self. The invitation is to build a staircase or elevator in this personality house so that we have the benefits of all levels. It is known that you are a well-known therapist, Janine, or a guide with your clients, travellers, as they are called in psychosynthesis, from all over the world and from different cultures because you have lived and practised yourself in many countries. So as a psychotherapist, you often ask questions and now it's your turn to answer and reflect I know that clients have regularly expressed that they are curious about you, wishing that they could hear or write your story. And now, as a 66-year-old woman, you have much wisdom to offer. It's a privilege to learn and share more about your practice. So let's start with some questions. Tell me, what inspired you to study and train in the area of psychology and psychosynthesis? I think I was inspired from the heart, really. I don't think I had a role model in my nearest environment, although my mother was a very caring and nurturing sort of person. And I think she, due to her circumstances, could not practice as a teacher or as a nurse. That was her desire. So it was coming from within, I have to say, the feeling of wanting to assist others. And that's only increased over the years as I've seen more suffering and I've felt a strengthening in myself to deal with that suffering. And tell us a little bit about what psychosynthesis philosophies and the theories are based on. So psychosynthesis was designed initially by a psychiatrist called Roberto Assagioli, who was born in 1888 and died in 1974. And he lived in the time of Jung and Freud, like so many gifted people like Rudolf Steiner and Uh, Montessori. There were a lot of those very visionary people around at that time. And he was inspired by a lot of the more eclectic theosophical type notions of the world. He was a Jewish person, but he was definitely interested in the more, I guess, spiritual aspects of life, not necessarily religion, but spiritual things in life. And he felt perhaps a little frustrated or stilted by the limited uh, notions that Freud had about people being driven by sexual desire or survival. He felt there were other levels in a person. And that particular way of looking at people fits very well with my own spiritual search. I've travelled expensively, as you know, in India and Nepal and overland in the late 70s and was really struck by the variety of religions and their expressions and their cultural rituals. And yet they're all having the same basic concept of love, which actually, if you think about that, doesn't get much of a look in in our regular work because we don't say, oh, that patient has a lot of love or that patient is very loving towards their neighbor. That doesn't end up in the case notes. We talk about other aspects. We talk about other significant things that we observe. So that's why sometimes psychosynthesis is called it's an optimistic enabling type of psychology. So that really drew me in. It was a merger of my personal stance in the world and then the techniques of psychosynthesis really fit that well. So I guess that description of love, is there a way that's described in psychosynthesis that resonates with you? Uh, Yeah, I think in psychosynthesis they talk a great deal about the higher self or the deeper self 
and that is described as an ontological identity, so it means it's not attached, it's eternal, it's in a sense almost like an observer part of ourselves. And from that point, I've noticed this in my own practice as well, it's easier to work with, say, traumatic issues because there's no judgment, there's no need to rescue, there's no need to change the situation or change the patient or the client, whatever you call it, or... To yeah. a fellow traveller. So they can sort of, it's easier for them to externalise from the situation. Yes. So whereabouts did you do your training? I was in my late 30s when I started studying psychosynthesis. I lived in Holland and they had an international college there that affiliated with people in Sweden and Spain and Belgium. And I did my training with that college. And initially I had some reservations because I thought it would be a bit airy-fairy. And I'm really quite a practical person, maybe. As a nurse, you become very kind of grounded in day-to-day reality. And that was certainly one of my desires, that I really wanted it to be practical and not all this sort of sitting in meditation and visualising. And so the college had also as a combination the Gestalt therapy, which is a very grounded, quite almost confrontational type of working. Um, So that was a perfect combination for me to work with that. I did three years of studies with them and it was an amazing, amazing eclectic group of people from all over the world that came there and really wise, authentic trainers as well. I still at times think, oh, what would Daniel say about this or whatever. So I felt really inspired by the trainers that I had. So it only confirmed that I'd made the right decision to come and study there. And are you still connected with any of those trainers or people that you went to school with? Uh, Yeah, I know still some people and uh, when I went last year to Italy to the house that Roberto Asadioli lived in, he's donated that to the Psychosynthesis Institute, I met with some people from Holland and I met with some acquaintances from that time and it felt like an immediate family feeling with them as well and they're all humble because they don't underestimate their own search for meaning and their own search for their own improvement, I guess. So it's like everyone's a part of it. Mm. So it takes, I guess, the ego out of the relationship between a therapist and the client. Yeah, true. And it's actually the same with uh, Gestalt therapy. The founder was Fritz Perls. And his favorite saying was the point where the meeting of the client's resistance and the therapist's resistance is the point of great transformation. So push through. That was his idea. So if you meet someone who's exhibiting something really outstanding to you, like a a tick or a flickering of the eyes constantly, instead of pretending it's not there, confront it, see what happens, and it becomes a point of enormous catharsis, so a letting out of all feelings, but it also becomes a point of great transformation, and I found that to be true as well. Mm. It's almost like you're letting yourself and the client be vulnerable with each other. As well. You've got that foundation to start with. Yes, that's a very good point, Sally. It's almost like you're sharing your humanness with the other person uh, in that, yeah, that vulnerability or that searching that can occur enormous bonds. You, you see that too when you see little elephants or little, I saw some white lions being born uh, recently on television. And I thought, oh, immediately you just feel this incredible love where you want to hold them. And so the vulnerability of these little creatures, but also the vulnerability of us humans, is often very gluing and very attracting and leads us back to the heart, Mm. I think. So what are the most significant bundle of ideas and by which philosophy was Robert Roberto Asagioli, the founder of Psychosynthesis, inspired by? Well, he was interested in theosophy, but he was born as a Jew, so the Kabbalah was important to him. Sorry, theosophy? Theosophy, yeah, which is that? was found by a lady called Anna Blavatsky, and she was studying in quite an intellectual way all the different world religions and comparing them and then making a combination of those practices early on already into meditation and into mindfulness. Personally, I think it's a very intellectual path. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily appeal to my skill sets or who I'm built like. So he was inspired by that, but he was certainly also 
a doctor and studied uh, psychoanalysis, of course. We've studied with Freud, and he met Jung a couple of times. And he was a humanist. He, just as an expression of that, when I went to the house that he lived in, the bottom floor of his house he gave to patients to live in who were poor. And one of the patients lived with him for 18 years in the house itself because he just felt that there was no difference between them and him. So it was not just a task or a job. He embodied it in his life as well. Do you have any favourite sayings by him? Yeah, my favourite saying is, calm, calm, we're in eternity, which puts so much perspective when you get caught up in the drama of life in, or in the need to maybe rescue someone or in the need to change yourself to kind of say, calm, calm, we're in eternity. It gives room to breathe. That's beautiful. How do you find, I guess, that quote... How does that resonate in your practice when you're with patients? Well, exactly there, that when I get caught up in, oh, this is terrible or this is upsetting or I need to offer more or I need to change some things or maybe I'm not enough as a therapist or I find that is indeed expanding my feeling of the person in their life script will find meaning. And um, I guess it pays into the notion of the Eastern philosophy of karma and reincarnation that at this point in time that person may be really suffering, but they will also, through that suffering, discover perhaps a wisdom that they know in no other way would discover. So... Mm. Meditation, visualization, practicing mindfulness, they're all really important components that I utilize. And they don't only come from psychosynthesis, they come from other philosophical paths Definitely. that I follow. It's almost like when I'm sort of thinking of when people have been through hard things, they would never want that of themselves. But then when they look back on it, they always say they're glad they have because they've learned so much about themselves or it's created a new sense of outlook. Yeah. It's interesting. Isn't it's it? interesting that we as an outsider can observe that. But if you say that to someone who's in the middle of a crisis, you might end up with conflict, isn't it? That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I suppose if you speak to them 10 years later even reading biographies of people who have had very traumatic experiences, they would never have wanted that in their lives. But after the fact, there's all these things that have come from it or relationships that they've formed. I often remind myself, it comes to the surface, that I worked with an AIDS patient who was in his last days of his illness process and was dying. This is in my role as a palliative care practitioner. And uh, he was desperate. He was in a lot of pain and he was emaciated. He didn't want to see anyone anymore because he felt embarrassed about himself. And then we were having a conversation as I was giving him a bath. And he said, you know, Janine, this has been really difficult. And I'm really, really scared to die. But I wouldn't have wanted to miss it for the world. Wow. It's an amazing experience, isn't it? So tell us now, let's move into, I guess, some of the rewards of your work as a psychotherapist. What's the most rewarding part of your day, I suppose? I'm always very curious when I meet new people because I do have that very distinct feeling that no one comes to see me without there being a very deep reason for it. Some people only come once. Some people come for... I have people that I've seen for 25 or over longer than that. And that is surprising to me, that it still remains relevant for them and it still remains relevant for me and that in that exchange we still find other explorations. And because you don't come from pathology or that's not the main kind of analysis that you make, that there's something wrong with that person, it remains inspiring and interesting and fascinating to see people go through their different life phases just like I am. I find that really interesting, the long-term people. But I also am always curious about who comes through my door. And I find it rewarding too to see that when I'm battling with an issue in myself, frequently I might get people that are in some way are also struggling with that. Or when I've just resolved something... I find that, hey, all of a sudden people come to me with that topic. Mm. Also, the wonderment that I have that people will often give me feedback that I can't really understand almost and think, really? Is that what they feel? Like they might say things like, you're so motherly or you're so compassionate. And they're not necessarily skills. They are aspects of my being, I Mm. guess, that I haven't necessarily done a training for it's just there and your qualities yeah and they are just yeah lovely to hear that 
I think the the flip side is that I sometimes find it a bit hard to do confrontational stuff. But that's where the gestalt comes in. That sometimes I'm pretty potent about Push what I through. dare to say. Yeah, you've mentioned sort of talking about what you enjoy most about your work, that sense of curiosity. And I know that in the social work practice, it's very important to remain curious. But I'm interested to hear for the people listening, what does that mean to you, curiosity, as a therapist? Well, for me, it means that the curiosity is expressed, uh, that people are so resilient often in the most difficult circumstances they find inner reflections that push them through that difficult phase or just a human struggle of... And I feel very fortunate with my life now. You know, I couldn't see that at the time. It's only in retrospect that you can join the dots. But I was a midwife once, so I saw people being born. A magical moment in life. I've seen many people die and have been part of that journey. Our human ability to work with challenges or to uh, figure out strategies to deal with the most difficult things. And my thoughts go to people who have had someone in their family who had suicide So how do you make meaning out of that experience? How do you overcome that guilt, that question why? Those sorts of deeper things and to inquire after that and to be indeed that empty canvas that Freud talks about is I don't need to kind of reflect on that. It's just fascinating to hear how people are able to be so creative with challenging things. Mm, And allowing them that opportunity to show or to feel or to be yeah Yeah, exactly and Um, and you know it's actually one of the easiest jobs i find in a sense to just sit with someone it sounds so simple because you can't just sit and meanwhile think of your shopping or whatever but to be really really present to empty out all your own personal things that's become a very pivotal practice for me to really clear out all the thoughts that I have and to be one-pointedly there in that moment with the client is so powerful for me, but it's also obviously very therapeutic. Mm. And I think sometimes we get a bit caught up in wanting to practice certain skills or techniques, but it is often just being there with a person that is so important. And very often they go away and say, I can't actually say what we talked about, or but I just felt so much better or I felt uplifted or... Mm. All right, so we've talked about what you found rewarding in your role and the things that you're, I suppose, grateful for. What about the challenges? What do you find particularly difficult in the work that you do, Janine? I think I said that already before. When uh, when people are very confrontational and angry, I find that difficult. I, I, as a person, try to avoid that. I think it comes a bit as a gender thing as well. I've I've heard so many people, this is one of those things of late, I've heard so many people confess, particularly women, I hate confrontation. So I find that hard when people are confrontational and angry and I find it hard also to see that it is their process. It's not necessarily against me. I find it hard to depersonalize that and think no that's not to do with me and Mm. whereas if people are sad I find it easy to stay with that when people are angry I find it not so easy to kind of say for example ask a question or be curious about that because my kind of fear is taking over then yeah and I suppose with the philosophy of having that empty canvas you're making yourself open to everything and that includes when people are angry or yeah yeah, I can imagine that would be very difficult. Yeah, but I I guess over the years also that notion that it is that person's journey and it's not necessarily a reflection on me, I've, I've become stronger at, at mm. that. I've, I've really put work into that as well because it is otherwise what we attract is only people that we can feel positive and pleasing with and that's not necessarily transformational. Sometimes through the anger people do discover enormous amounts of, and, and of recent years, I've had severe anger against one person in my life. And it's been a major teaching for me. So much learning about, you know, setting boundaries and 
being defensive about self and to not taking shit from others, basically. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it is, it, anger should not be seen as a negative only. It has lots of good qualities, protectiveness. Mm. But, um, yeah, it's not naturally my strength. And I guess having gone through that yourself and realising the resilience that you've created, that probably makes it easier when you see others in that state to sort of walk alongside them yeah. and maintain your curiosity. Yeah, for sure. So is there a central, I guess, or a strong theme in your work? Yeah, I, I work with a very broad lot of topics. I work with families, I work with children, um, and the central kind of philosophy or theme there is that the healing will come. There's a kind of an optimistic belief that people will find their healing and that I'll be part of that, and I feel a gratitude for that. And I have confidence about that now that I can, even if it's only once, be helpful with that. And that's where that description of the house is so potent that we all have a potentiality. And when you think about it, when you fall in love with someone, you're often very much focusing on their potential. You can't see anything wrong with them. You just think that person will give you all the things that so far have been un, unfulfilled. Un, unfulfilled. Yeah. So that people reaching their potential is ultimately people f- creating self-love and not love as in a narcissistic, egotistical way, but love as in an appreciation of their deeper self. I'm quite inspired at the moment by uh, the self-compassion theory that is around, which actually says that we should have a compassion for our deeper self, not necessarily our ego, you know, self-esteem things, but mainly the kind of appreciation and the curiosity about that deeper self. And and through compassion, we can heal so much. I guess that's the other strong thing that I feel is that when people are afraid, transformation is much more difficult. So when they're afraid of their partner or when they're afraid of their life itself, then transformation is much more difficult. But when they are feeling you know, nurtured or empathetically held, then they can transform, they can be vulnerable, they can reinvent themselves. The The large majority of the people that I work with are people in the middle phase of their life where a lot of the kind of earlier days issues have, done, have been done and the meaning, the aspect of meaning, how do I prepare myself now for my death even or my end of life or what what is my legacy those are some of the things i guess through my palliative care work as well that mm. are really interesting i think yeah you talked a little bit about i guess the challenges of the work that you do and i know that there's a high percentage of psychotherapists and other people within the helping profession who suffer from burnout yeah um, or they're demoralized um, by the way that they have to carry their clients pain how have you managed to realise that this is a part of the role, but how have you helped to avoid burnout? And have you got any helpful tips? Yeah, I think um, humour is a very important one. I can actually sometimes almost artificially make myself giggle and laugh as a, as a remedy to just get over one of the strong kind of attachments that I might have to someone's pain, because that does happen. I think for me there's a variety that is important. You know, I love bushwalking, I love working in the garden and and there's a whole variety of activities that I do that kind of divert my mind away from that and that deep, deep knowledge and belief that that person has the need to learn from this experience. And what is also interesting, we talked about anger before, is that sometimes setting up really good boundaries is a very important skill and tip to say, I'm delegating that back to you. And to when the session is finished, sometimes I do what they call an aura cleaning, where you rub your hands together and you wipe all the connected energy that you might have received from that person inadvertently or advertently. You wipe that away and send it back to Mother Earth. I find that really helpful, and I often teach people that as well. I do think deep down my philosophy is that I'm not the doer. If people are still not healing or if there's conflict, I can see more clearly I'm not the doer of Mm. that. I can leave that with them. And I don't feel that I have an 
too strong a responsibility for their recovery, which is a trick, really, because a lot of people, particularly when they're in despair, that's how they're trying to engage you. You know, like, what are you going to offer me? What What is going to happen now? What how are you, you going to do? How can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. And to reinforce through visualization and meditation with them. I do a lot of visualization activities with people as well that there is more to them. There is more to them than this desperate person that's looking for solutions. Yeah, so that is my self-help practice as well. And I, I'm very blessed. I have a very varied life. I have beautiful children like yourself and a, a very good connection with friends sort of that restore my energy. Mm. It's interesting. I think that's something common. I know that from sort of people that I work with that finishing a day or having after a hard session a way to look after yourself is by doing what you talked about or some people will have a shower or change their clothes or it's almost like you need to mentally shift out of that focus to be able to look after yourself yeah do you have anything that you do before a session or before you start a day of psychosynthesis yes I do actually always have a bit of a grounding practice I I'm now very fortunate. I work from home and as you know, we have a beautiful tranquil setting with lots of trees and a big national park in front of us. And I look through that window and sometimes I have an open eye meditation or I have a closed eye meditation and I send in that meditation love and light and ask for some assistance to be able to be present with the person. So... And there's preparation that goes into it. And sometimes I have an intuition, oh, that person is going to come with that topic. I need to read up on that. That person wants to make an advanced directive for the end of their life. I need to look up on that. So it's sometimes very practical, but Mm. most of the time it's just a stilling of the mind. So you're preparing that focus. Yeah. Okay. How have you seen your work change over the years? Are there things that you do differently now or that you did before or things that you used to do before that you don't now? Yeah, I think I was more relying on my training in the earlier days. I felt like, oh, I need to recite that list of things that you need to do or I need to read up on that. I did a a lot of training and I went to a lot of workshops and, and did of course in all this supervision and having personal sessions with people has been always part of my practice I'm also really benefiting from just writing down my own reflections almost letter to myself sometimes that I write and over the years I think that people have become perhaps less reliant on the therapist they are very good in researching their own topics and they often have embarked on a practice of mindfulness or meditation or whatever it is, and they're more aware of, you know, the general components of good health, walking, exercise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there's been tremendous uh, evolution of the clients themselves, that they, the need for assistance is not as kind of, of course, people in crisis still need it, but I don't tend to see those people in my practice a lot. But overall, I think people are very well aware. They're very well equipped to research things. Saying that, though, it doesn't mean that they can do without that personal connection with someone. I think sometimes there's been a bit of an illusionary notion that if you read that self-help book, from there onwards, you always be able to be assertive or from there on you be able to practice things. I don't think that's true. That's an intellectual exercise. I think... What needs to happen for people is they need to tune into their heart as well. So it's a heart, body, mind, spiritual experience for them. Mm. And I think it's difficult to do that on your own, I think. It's difficult because you can kid yourself so easily that you think, yeah, I've got this figured and then life throws us a crisis and we realise that we're not equipped at all to deal with that. So, And also as a therapist, I see that, that people are more choosy about who they want to work with and so they're much more clear about their criteria, what they want from a therapist they research it really well you know they look at websites and so forth before they come i think that the other part that is missing for quite a lot of people is that they don't have elders or wise people in their general life so whereas they might have had a really wise neighbor before, we've become all a bit insular and compartmentalized mm, in our lives. That loss of community, definitely. Indeed, and that's such a healing factor. So for people to be linked up with 
any type of community is so healing. It's, mm. It never should be underestimated. And for that matter, too, I'm linked up with a couple of enormously important groups for me that have become family. As a migrant, I think you need that as well. Mm. I came to this country, as you know, from uh, Europe. So I think that shift is interesting and exciting and very notable. You know, that people sometimes, I see that a lot, that particularly younger people think, yeah, I understand that. But understanding and knowing and feeling and integrating is quite a different process. So I still think there's always going to be a need for a therapist. So you've touched on it a little bit just now. Um, You were talking earlier about working with clients that are older or starting to think about what they leave behind or what their meaning is for their life. What sort of things do you notice when you work with younger people? Yeah, I think younger people have uh, a lot of dynamic things happening to them. You know, there's a lot of influences and in a sense... Sometimes it may feel that they don't have a stable kernel of strength within themselves. They're taken by a notion of someone else giving them feedback or they're taken by things at work or whatever. So there's a there's a, a kind of... There's a positive and a negative, of course, isn't it? There's an ability to change and be flexible, but there's also, at times, a, a risk of depression and feeling self-loathing and, and negativity about themselves. I think they, younger people are often much more creative in what they want to take on as, oh, I'll try that. So it's far more dynamic in working with them and they're more risk-taking and they, they'll do a silly exercise or something like that. And I do think that they seem to be more focused on how they can themselves as a person manifest themselves in the world. That's really important to them. How can I be relevant? How can I, not only financially, but in lots of ways, how can I make a difference? That's there for an older person as well, but more with what do I leave behind? Um, Whereas for a younger person, that still needs to happen. How do I create that? Yeah, and I guess the other thing that younger people struggle more with is, is their attachment figures so that maybe their mother, father or whatever it might be, that they have kind of aspects of that that they're still ill at ease with. Mm -hmm. And I work a lot with people with family conflict for that reason as well because the conflict is often internalised as well. They might have had a really aggressive father, but they've become aggressive towards themselves as well. So that's really interesting to work with people and say, so how is this in you or where do you see that coming back? It's very interesting when people make that penny-dropping discovery. Hey, that's how I do it. Yeah. Um, I can see you thinking lots about yourself as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. I think I'm also thinking about the work that I do and, you know, attachments. We know for for children and young people how important attachments to a caregiver is and that they need to have a primary attachment in order to be able to thrive Um, and that isolation is toxic to all humans. So looking, I guess I'm reflecting on my own work as well and in the impact of some of the things that you're saying. It's very yeah. powerful, Mum. Yeah, thank you. So we'll finish off um, just with some questions and reflections from yourself around spirituality. You've talked about this a little bit already. Um, what does the word spirituality mean to you? I think it, means, it has had different meanings in my life at different stages, But spirituality indeed means that aspect of ourselves that is full of mystery and is full of unexplainable things and that is also positive and optimistic, I guess gives us a strengthening about who we are. And the rituals that I do, quite a few rituals with people as well or the meditations that I do with people allude to that. They're very practical for me that sometimes you might have a visualisation that's almost more powerful than your real life. So that there is more to us, the the moreness of life, the more expanded consciousness that we can tap into sometimes. And in psychosynthesis, they talk about there's a map of consciousness that's shaped as an egg. And if you go through a crisis in your life, you end up in the bottom of the egg. You, You discover all sorts of yucky things, maybe of your past, all sorts of repressed fears. And then you come back into the center again where your consciousness lives most of the time. And then frequently people have a loop through the higher aspects of their lives. So they all of a sudden have a sense of wonderment or they see nature different or they have an inkling about something uh, 
uh, miraculous that has happened to them. So that to me is part of the spirituality as well, that we have components that we don't know till we've been squeezed with a crisis. And then that, I guess, the aspect of the higher self, as they talk in psychosynthesis, is like a little star that's on the top of the egg that actually reminds us of those higher aspects of us, that eternity aspect again. So Mm -hmm. through meditation, you strengthen that in yourself as well. And yet also come back to the here and now and that sense of self that is in the core of... It's almost like the yolk of the egg. That's how I see it. It's always there and it's got all the nutrients. You just need to find your way back there. (laughs) That's it. I guess you've alluded to meditation and mindfulness as ways that you assist your clients to help find their spirituality. Is there anything else that you do that you can think of? Yeah, contact with nature, I think. I really reinforced that. And I think I I was really strengthened lately by a a person in the Shetland Islands who's prescribing a health plan with all the practices that we can do in nature. He's a GP. And instead of prescribing medication alone, he prescribes walk your neighbor's dog, uh, have a walk in, have, have a touch of a leaf, stroke a cactus or whatever is all those incredibly healing aspects of nature that are so evident you know to all of us so that's certainly one of the things that i work with in myself as well Mm. very fortunate to live in australia so we are we are (laughs) so the final question and the juicy one we left the juiciest to last what have you observed about your own spiritual journey i think i can probably put that almost in one line that indeed it's true that we need to be interconnected. It's that sense of community. We are interdependent. So as a therapist, I'm dependent on my client's willingness to work and that we are more than we think we are, really. That's what I've discovered over time and I'm starting to feel more confident with it. I'm not naturally a super confident person, but I've started to feel through the illustrations that I'm seeing in my work and in my uh, life, that that is there and that I can be confident about that. Mm. You've allowed yourself to tap into it. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for answering some of my questions. Thanks, Al. And also thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Thanks, Mum.